thanks for inviting me. I think the lecture we just heard makes a perfect access point for my topic. So as you can read and see, um, what I'm going to talk about is how does new technology provided by Industry 4.0 change the job of a carpenter? Um, University from Liechtenstein, I'm Wolfgang Schwarzmann. And um, so the title of the conference is about digital reality and space. So now here comes this guy and talks about carpenter stuff. Why, wh where is there something in between? Why do we have to hear him, what he's uh, talking about? So initially, I would, I, would I would like to mention four interesting positions to keep in mind. First one, um, it was a, an interview conducted by Miriam Fuchs with Matthias Kohler. I hope some of you may know him from the ETH. He does a lot of n nice stuff together with Gramazio, Gramazio and Kohler. And so it's written in German, um, but I can translate it easily. Ein Zimmermann arbeitet künftig vielleicht mit Robotern zusammen. So the title means that a carpenter in future might be cooperating with a robot. Um, so this addresses exactly my topic. This possibility of might be working together sounds a little bit interesting. The second one, some of you might know Der Spiegel, the German magazine. And as we can see over the last centuries, they always came up with some kind of the same topics on their cover. It was always called Fortschritt macht arbeitslos, which means that by technology we all will be unemployed. What I find interesting, so the first one was in 1964, 78, and 2016 was the last one, so it's not that far behind. We always see this human behaving robot uh, in the middle. You can see how he's holding the employed guy and throwing him out of the company. There is always this kind of human machine doing the job of the human. Um, but is it really true? The third position I think that is important is by Konrad Wachsmann. So in 1913, in 1930, sorry, he came up with the small statement other than these, and he says something like, the machine in factories produce our houses. It's not the traditional craftsman anymore. So he started to proclaim some new era where art is now dedicated to technology and the new building comes out of some kind of building machine. Machine. <laughs> So this was in 1930, even though this book appeared uh, a few years ago, 1995, 90 years ago. And the fourth position I want to mention is the PhD by Christoph Schindler from the ETH. He came up um, with an illustration of the profession of a carpenter, and in the end he made the conclusion that the job of a carpenter transformed over each step our society participated. So some, some in the early years, they were building everything from wood by hand. Then came steam power. Then, of course, came electricity. I think everybody knows the story of technology somehow here. And still, we have carpenters working on wood construction things. So why, why do I want to show you these positions? Because um, as you can see on this image, that is quite an old image, or actually not. Um, the carpenter is working on the same piece of wood as the robot does, and he asks the robot some kind of, we are working together, aren't we? So if we remember the first uh, slide I showed you from Gramazio Cola, where he said that the carpenter of the future might be working together with a robot at some day, um, when are robots taking over in some manner? Who is going to be unemployed by these robots? I think we have to rearrange our mind. And I don't think that we have to ask when are robots taking over. But I think the right question is, in what kind of everyday life have robots already taken over? So that we don't really see this moment of Terminator entering the room and making us all unemployed. This is the focus of my PhD. Of my PhD. How can we make use of the strength of the machine 
by combining it together with the intelligence of a carpenter might have, and enriching it, of course, with the smart things that appear nowadays. So how does it look in a carpenter workshop nowadays? Um, there are no orange robots, or not, not, there are only a few ones I saw, um, but these are very special workshops. Uh, most of the carpenters buy uh, Hundeka. I don't know if you know the company from Germany. It's the robot in behind. And it does actually everything that we would like to see when we're talking about Industry 4.0. So this machine is already connected to the Internet of Things. We can do predictive maintenance. Um, actually, it can make all kinds of, of, of cuts and scars and things that we need. So even though it's not orange and it's not crazy looking like a human robot, it is already the robot in the workshop of a carpentry. So, and he's still working together with a carpenter. Um, so far as some kind of background. In the research, we're going to conduct the theoretical fr foundation from uh, the Actor Network Theory that was founded by Latour and Calon. And we try to describe the profession of a carpenter, which is here, more as some person in between a network of interwoven structures. So we're going to take a closer look at the carpenter and the robot. In this case, of course, I used the icon of this arm because it's so branded on our mind. And we are going to take a closer look how these two actants or how these two participants influence the rest in between. So mm, how, how does the job of a carpenter change with this robot on his side and how does it affect their everyday approach? How are we going to do this? So the, the, the planned uh, paper that, is, that we are currently collecting data for is called What New Applications Can Be Observed Where CNC Joinery Machine Promotes a Renaissance of Traditional Knowledge in the Profession of a Carpenter. Sounds a little bit long and dry, but um, if we look at historical technological innovation that was in the brain of a carpenter, but that isn't used anymore. We can find this one. It's a classic combination that was used often by Grubenmann in his wooden bridges. Um, you make a composite wood beam, beam just by cutting it very precise. Over time, we got glue laminated wood, which is much cheaper. You can get it in every size you need it. So there is no need for this technology anymore. And somebody said, yeah, super boring. We don't need it anymore because we have the huge uh, chunks of wood that we can laminate. It's, by the way, labor intensive and glue lamb is much cheaper. When we take a look at the office of Hermann Kaufmann, where, of course, I was working before, um, <laughs> I could find this picture here. Um, they, I, I think this building they are currently erecting. It's made from um, Baubuche. I don't know if you know the, the, this new wood from Paul Meyer. It's super strong wood. And the only solution where they could uh, detail the roof structure was by this um, zigzag shape here. Because the forces were too big, of course, they would have had the possibility to put in a huge steel piece. But in this case, it's some kind of more traditional solution for a detail. So. I would call it some kind of renaissance of traditional joinery in the job of a carpenter. By the way, I phoned Hermann Kaufmann. I saw it on his uh, homepage. Um, I'm, since I think, four years, not anymore in his office. So I phoned him and said, hey, Hermann, I saw this picture on your homepage. Um, so did you, did you have this idea with this, you know, this zigzag shape looks super good, perfect for my PhD? Then he said, what? I, I don't know what you're talking about. So in the, second, uh, in the second call, I called his employee who makes the project. And he said, no, it was not an idea by us, but it was the idea of the, um, the carpenter himself. So he said, yeah, of course, we could use huge screws and pieces of metal, but I think it would be much easier and much nicer to solve it by wood. This is only possible because they use technology, of course. Nobody would be able to cut this zigzag shape. The second example, um, so I'm 
too fast, sorry. Um, the second example is the zip shape by Christoph Schindler on the second picture. Christoph Schindler, he's not, a, he's not a carpenter, but at least it's an example where you can see they made use of those pieces of wood that have slightly different angles by cutting. And afterwards, when you push those two pieces of wood together, like a zipper, um, it doesn't fit together perfectly, but they get some kind of tension in between, and the wood that you will have in the end starts to bend. So the bent wood is the same as the two pieces next to them, just you just have to put them together like a zipper. So in this case, these are two examples where this traditional technology of um, the composite beam got new applications, but only because we have new technological solutions. And only because those people knew what a carpenter had on his mind, because otherwise we would have made a huge steel uh, knot inside, or we just would have made some glue lamb. Um, so how, am I, how, how are we collecting data? Of course, we go into the carpenter workshops. Uh, we go in full body contact. So we're going to talk to the carpenters. What solutions do they find? Where do they work together with the machine? What, what do they like? And we're going to take a look at companies with CNC machines and make a comparison to companies without CNC machines. And um, so the picture that you can see on the left on the right, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is a CNC joinery machine that we had in a company where I was, work where I was work working. And I think it was two weeks before I ended the job there. And I, in the morning, I went there and stick those eyes on the machine, which made it super human or super, super animal look like. And the carpenters came, and they were complaining a little bit and said, oh, you, you idiot, what did you do with our machine? And then I said, you know, I just wanted to stick some eyes on them, so it's not a it's not a not a problem for the machine working. Well, it looks stupid. We are not we are not here for fun and things like this. And then I said, yeah, but don't you feel a little bit more comfortable with your work friend, with a colleague, who who actually has to build all the kitchen uh, kitchen stuff? Because when a, a carpenter or a, a joiner, so a smaller smaller scale, when a joiner makes a kitchen, all the the, the boxes where you put in the stove and the fridge, this is not nice work that you want to do as a joiner. So, but you still have to give it to the client in the end. What a joiner wants to do is, I want to make a nice table where the people sit and they can touch the wood. But they don't want to make the box where the fridge is inside and everybody will only see a white box. So um, with this small hack, um, of course, somehow I a little bit at least opened their eyes made them feel a little bit uncomfortable. And of course, afterwards, I had to pay the snack for the whole company. Um, so anyway, yeah, one minute and 50. I'm sorry. So uh, I'm a little bit too fast. But I think it shouldn't be no, should be no problem. If somebody has a question, um, we just uh, get a coffee. Yeah. 